This is the first of a series of tutorials on becoming an evidence-based analyst. In this first installment, we will be reviewing the first step in evidence-based analysis, ask an answerable question. Each slide in this presentation will provide information on a key concept of evidence-based analysis, or EBA for short. We will begin with a review of the purpose and steps of EBA. Then you will learn how to properly construct a scientific question. A scientific question is one which can be answered by designating the likely causes of an outcome we seek to influence. Next, you will develop an understanding of the principles and techniques for analyzing these claims. Please remember that the discussion forum is available to you to ask questions or post answers to others' questions about EBA concepts and techniques. The forum is also where you will practice the application of EBA procedures by submitting and presenting analyses for review and comment by other members of the discussion forum. Your practice should begin by identifying an answerable question that you feel is of critical interest or value to you. Evidence from learning science tells us that you will benefit most from the skills being developed through these tutorials if you practice the techniques on issues that are highly meaningful to you. Lastly, by frequently practicing the EBA techniques, you will be ready to deliver more effective analyses and recommendations that offer valuable and deep insights which demonstrate your distinctive expertise. In part two of this tutorial, we will be exploring how to search for evidence related to the claim that results from the answerable question we will develop in part one. So what is evidence-based analysis? Evidence-based analysis is a systematic review and evaluation of evidence that supports or questions claims regarding the factors that influence important individual or organizational outcomes. Denise Rousseau from Carnegie Mellon University was the first to propose that evidence-based analysis is essential for effective managerial decision-making. She emphasized that wise managers apply the scientific method when making a recommendation or deciding on a course of action. They are distrustful of information that comes from only one source or was based on a single experience. Or worse, was an opinion stated that is not grounded in predictions that were supported by rigorous evidence analysis. The application of evidence-based practice in the medical profession provides a useful guide for effectively implementing these techniques in management practices. Medicine has advanced rapidly over the past quarter century. Much of this advance can be credited to the use of high quality evidence collection related to the clinical protocols, procedures, and techniques. The highest quality of evidence is the systematic review, which is able to more accurately estimate the effect size of an intervention or causal factor on a desired outcome. Most important, the development of systematic reviews enables medical science to better understand the risks associated with clinical practices that for will lead to more effective decision making on the best practices to apply in any given situation. There are four steps required to perform EBA. These steps allow us to develop or evaluate a claim statement. The claim statement proposes that causal factors can substantively impact a desired outcome or outcomes. The process steps are, one, ask a question that can be answered with evidence. Two, propose a model that explains and predicts the impact of proposed causal factors. Three, evaluate the evidence to determine if it supports or questions the model. Questions allow us to discover where or when the model may not apply or where the causal factors may not have as much impact. In other words, where we should have reservations or lower confidence in applying the model. And finally, four, assess the risk of the recommendation based on this evidence by analyzing the variance and evidence supporting it. We will be reviewing each of these process steps in a series of becoming an evidence-based analyst tutorials. This tutorial will focus on the first step, ask an answerable question. To understand how to create an answerable question, you must first know what types of questions can be answered by systematically accumulating evidence. An answerable question seeks to accomplish one of the four goals of scientific management listed on this slide. Each of the goals of scientific management prepares a manager or a leader to make effective decisions or take effective actions. First, a question can seek to describe a process to determine what is likely to happen next. Second, a question could seek to predict if an outcome is likely based on the current conditions. Third, a question could seek to explain 
why the situation is happening. Finally, fourth, a question could seek to control how or when to create a change in the present conditions. EBA requires that we consider claims that can be stated in the form of a hypothesis. Specifically, we must be able to state the factors that are expected to influence the occurrence or degree of an outcome. However, not all claims meet this requirement. Therefore, a claim is almost synonymous with a hypothesis, but not quite. For a claim statement to be a hypothesis, it must be possible to test the claim by reviewing evidence. Let's begin then with a review of the four types of claims described by Stephen Toulmin in his Introduction to Academic Arguments. Toulmin identified four types of claims, evaluative, definitive, designative, and advocative. We will briefly review each of these types. For a claim to be used to evaluate an argument, it must be debatable using evidence. A claim is debatable if evidence allows us to estimate the probability that the size of an outcome will change when the proposed causal conditions are present. You should practice creating claims that meet the requirements of each type. Practicing will help you in identifying these types of claims when you read them or hear them stated by others. Knowing the type of claim will enable you to identify what forms of evidence are best to evaluate the claim. You should now think of an example for each of the four claim types. You should pause the presentation while you think of your examples. I will give you a few seconds now to pause the playback. We will now review an example of applying the four types of claims. Our example will attempt to answer questions regarding the benefits to your health of eating spinach versus other more pleasantly tasting foods, like chocolate, for instance. The first type of claim we will review is the evaluative claim. Evaluative claims are opinions that express the writer's or speaker's beliefs or values about a topic. They usually involve some form of judgment about what others should or should not do. Is this type of claim debatable? Could you find evidence that would predict whether you should or should not eat spinach every day? I will give you a few seconds now to think about your answer. An evaluative claim is not debatable. The author of the claim is simply stating their opinion. They are entitled to their belief that you ought to eat spinach every day. However, you might not agree with the reasons that the author provides for why spinach should be eaten every day. You are also entitled to your opinion. An evaluative claim is not debatable because each person is entitled to hold different values. You may agree or not agree with another person's values, but that doesn't make their values right or wrong. They are just the same or different than yours. Therefore, the only evidence that could be obtained on an evaluative claim involves the degree to which people agree on a common set of values, not how probable the claim statement may be in accurately predicting an outcome. Let's now move on to the next type of claim, a definitive claim. A definitive claim defines a concept by specifying what characteristics, dimensions, or attributes are indicators that the concept is present in the current situation. Concepts proposed in a designative or advocative claim, to be discussed next, are referred to as factors, a cause or an outcome. Therefore, from here forward, we will refer to the concept definition created by a definitive claim as the factor definition. What allows us to determine the effectiveness of a definitive claim is whether the measurements of the characteristics, dimensions, or attributes are reliable predictors of whether the factor is present. Collectively, characteristics, dimensions, and attributes are referred to as indicators. For example, a definitive claim could define spinach by specifying its color, shape, or food category. Each of these indicators can be measured to determine how spinach-like is a food product that we are holding in our hands. 
Notice that this simple definitive claim may fail to distinguish spinach from other food, such as lettuce. Imagine surveying a group of people using the indicators provided in the definitive claim shown. Each indicator is a question you would ask when presenting a food product to them. For example, is this produce item green? If you showed them every item in a produce section of the grocery store, what would be the relation between their answers to those questions and the correct identification of each produce item? Would spinach be the only item that was correctly identified? To establish a definitive claim, we must begin with a model that specifies the indicators. The model can be drawn by arrows that point away from the factor to each of the indicators. The reliability estimates of each factor are found through an evidence analysis. This analysis produces statistics called factor loadings for individual indicators or the Kronbach alpha coefficient for a group of indicators. We will be reviewing these statistics in a future tutorial. The definitive claim model is expected to guarantee or warrant, like a warranty, that the indicators are sufficient and necessary to identify that factor. The evidence for this warrant model is either descriptive examples that back the claim or quantitative estimates that ground the claim. To conclude this tutorial, we will now review the two types of claims that examine problems and solutions, the designative and advocative claims. Both designative and advocative claims predict the factors that will increase or reduce the change in an outcome or group of outcomes. The primary difference between these two types of claims is what factors serve as the target outcome. A designative claim identifies the causal factors that influence a desired consequence of behavior. A designative claim is therefore predicting the factors that are causes of some problem we seek to solve. Accordingly, designative claims can also be referred to as problem claims. An advocative claim identifies the factors that can change the size of the causal factors specified in the designative claim. Advocative claim factors may also influence a causal factor by mediating or moderating the effect of the causal factor on the outcome. Since they influence causal factors, an advocative claim can also be referred to as a solution claim. For example, spinach will improve your health more than chocolate is a designative claim. It designates which causal factors, spinach, are likely to have a more substantive impact on a desired outcome, health, than other causal factors, such as chocolate. Designative claims can be debated primarily on the probability or size of the predicted effect. We can test the claims shown by examining the relative influence that spinach and chocolate have on health. A warrant model for designative claims is developed by drawing arrow lines that show the direction of influence from causal factors to the outcome factor or factors. An initial study of these factor relationships provides the prediction estimates, which is usually shown above the line forming a path from cause to outcome. These effect size estimates are typically correlations and can be reported as beta coefficients to distinguish them from the alpha coefficients that relate to definitive claims. In a future tutorial, we will be examining these causal path models that are usually used to diagram a designated claim warrant model. Designated claims are evaluated primarily by grounding studies. By examining a series of inferential studies, we can determine how substantive or conditional are the predicted effects. Our objective in this analysis is to determine how confident we can be that the warrant model is accurately depicting the likely effects of the factors shown in the model. The best evidence will provide confidence intervals, which show the range of possible effects we can expect with 90 or 95 percent confidence. This is the level of confidence you should have if you are to be an effective and decisive decision maker, similar to when you select very confident if you are rating an answer to a question. Now that you have understanding of the three types of evidence-based claims, definitive, designative, and advocative, you are ready to begin practicing application of your knowledge in identifying claims in your readings. You should identify the type of claim that is made. Try to draw a diagram that connects a factor to its predicted indicators for definitive claims. Draw links between factors to diagram the causal paths of a designated claim. In part two of this tutorial on asking an answerable question, we will further examine the effects of spinach and chocolate on health. 
we will seek to validate the claim that resulted from our answerable question. Would eating spinach every day always improve your health more than eating chocolate, specifically dark chocolate? We will discuss the findings from evidence that suggest there are some health conditions that may be better addressed by eating dark chocolate. These conditions will suggest that we must reserve judgment on whether eating spinach daily is always the best choice. Finally, we will use this example to show you how to search for a warrant model and the evidence related to it using Google Scholar.